Okay, so my name's Emily Nino, and um, what I'm going to do today is talk to you a little bit about the Historic Environment Scotland archives, how we've been investing in our digital infrastructure. Um, I'm going to try and compare and contrast the Scottish and English context, because we're seeing a lot of English voices today, and um, look a bit at Scotland's archaeology strategy and finish up with a couple of examples of reuse of archaeological archives. So who are we? Um, so Historic Environment Scotland was founded in 2015. Um, we've kind of gone through the reverse process that uh, English Heritage went through. Um, we brought together Historic Scotland and the Royal Commission for the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland. And I'm not going to list all the stuff that we do, but you can see from the slide that we do an awful lot more than just archives. But since the forming of HES, that role in terms of collecting and preserving our archives have now been enshrined in law. So they're definitely central to the function of HES. So I'm the digital archive manager and I work in the archaeological... No, I don't. I work in the archives engagement team. Um, there we go. So what do we collect? So HES holds information on... And archives documenting Scotland's archaeology, its buildings, its maritime record and the historic environment, the collections known as the National Record for the Historic Environment. And we're interested in evidence of humans' interaction with the landscape in Scotland, including our coasts and seas. And we take in the full range of documentary archives, not just digital, we take in paper records as well. And it's important to highlight just briefly that we don't just ex focus exclusively on archaeology either, we also collect materials relating to architecture, including architectural design drawings and beautiful um, images such as the one I have up here. Now, so HES has been investing in digital preservation in our digital collections in the last couple of years. Um, we've been investing heavily in our technical infrastructure that underpins the work we do for the long-term preservation of the archaeological archives we hold. We've been working with a commercial partner called Preservica to bring together their commercial preservation repository system and tie that together with our own repository tools and services and our in-house catalogue. We're working towards going live shortly with a fully integrated system that will ensure that every record that um, our staff create moves seamlessly from our in-house cataloguing system into this preservation repository. So working with Preservica has allowed us to automate a lot of our functions and allowed us to achieve more with our existing resource of staff. It means that, for example, for things like dissemination records, we're able to automatically on ingest migrate things like Microsoft Word documents to PDFs, which means that a huge amount of material that's sitting in our existing holdings will be made available online for the first time. And that frees up a lot of staff time who've previously been ha having to do that manually. Um, we're also doing that for a number of different formats, so we have a, um, a migration pathway for Corel draw files, for example, and the scope to broaden that out once we're live is, is enormous. Um, and the Preservica system makes it really easy for us to manage all these different versions of the files that we hold, so the preservation copy, the original copy, and as I've been mentioning, the dis dissemination copies. Um, as well as investing heavily in our technical underpinning since um, the, the beginning of the project, HS has created another permanent post working with me in the digital archive and just recently we kicked off a big digitisation project bringing in five new temporary members of staff working on digitising huge amounts of our um, analogue archive materials but also working on cataloguing our not inconsiderable digital archive cataloguing backlog as well. So that's going to be a major... Um, shift in the next couple of years in terms of seeing the, the volume of material going online. Um, I think it's interesting to note, however, um, that these kind of big <coughs> infrastructure projects, they take up a huge amount of staff time, they cost a lot of money, but they're really quite <coughs> invisible to the user and I think to the practitioner community. You know, at the end of this project, there isn't going to be a shiny new front end, there's not going to be anything wizzy for people to see, but we've spent a lot of time and money doing this and it's this sort of work that really underpins the long-term sustainability of the digital material that you're all creating. Um, and I think, I think that often the lack of understanding around this makes it hard for people to understand the, the justification behind the amount of effort and cost 
that's required for archaeological archives. And I think that as a sector, we could do more in terms of communicating um, the value and justification behind that. And I think that the, the issues of value and cost are really quite closely intertwined here. <coughs> So um, today one of my goals was to try and provide a kind of contrast and context to this discussion looking at similarities and differences between the Scottish and the English context and I think that by understanding and seeing how we're trying to do the same things differently we can, we can better understand and reflect on what we're doing and hopefully come to new and better ways of doing things in the future. So um, for me one of the the, the best ways for me to kind of get a, a quick overview of where everybody's at in the English context, it's not the one I work in, was looking at HIAS. And I think these first two um, key principles of, of HIAS uh, help to contrast the situation between Scotland and England. So here we see local authority HERs are the first point of call for primary trusted source of investigative research and data knowledge. And historical England should be the first point of call for primary and trusted source of national data sets such as the National Maritime Record. And that's probably the key difference, I think, between <coughs> Scotland and England. Um, this is a breakdown of the Scottish Historic Environment Data Strategy, published in 2014, which recognises all the players in the Scottish context as trusted sources of data, but emphasises the different purposes for which that data is collected and curated. HES is the lead body delivering the Scottish Government Historic Environment Strategy, provides a centralised resource for both terrestrial and maritime data and represents Scotland in the Marine Data Information Network. And as I've already been describing, HES has been investing very heavily in its digital archive programme and the historic environment data we hold. And I think it's, it makes sense to centralise this type of activity because it requires significant financial investment, specific technical expertise. And that's really quite uneconomical to try and deliver differently or in a decentralised way. Um, so the rest of the, the key principles for HIAS, um, we find much closer synergies between Scotland and England. Uh, HES is, occupies this role for Scotland. Um, so for example, principles six and seven would take primary responsibility for this, for the digital archive programme. And uh, principle eight, Digital data should be supported by material archives in safe repositories accessible to the public. We're supporting that through the Scottish archaeological strategy. Um, so I'm also talking about the Mendoza Review, because uh, I think it provides another really interesting perspective on what's happening in England. And for me, the key things that I took from that was a recommendation that all museums should charge for deposit going forward, but also that, and we, we heard this before, that we the DCMS should relieve museums of this expectation that they should be attempting to curate digital archaeology data. And to, um, to draw the comparison with Scotland, the situation with the museum sector isn't quite as bad. Um, everywhere in Scotland is still collecting. That's not to say everything is rosy, though. We do face issues with a lack of um, archaeological curators and expertise in the museum sector, and they need help with informing disposal decisions. And HES is trying to to look into how can we can support that process. There's, there's no plans in Scotland currently to start <coughs> charging for the deposit of documentary archive, and there's no requirement in Scotland to think about separating out um, physical and digital documentary archive, as is recommended um, in the response to the Mendoza review, where they talk about things should be digital first, and we, we should be rapidly um, putting to the past the idea of paper documentary records. I, th I think it's quite interesting there that what we seem to be seeing is a recognition of what I said earlier, which is it makes sense to try and centralise these functions because, because of the, the effort and the expertise and the costs involved with the long-term curation of data. And... Um, and I, I guess the fact that we're seeing these recommendations shows that it has proven to be uneconomical to try and deliver that in a decentralised way. Um, the other thing I would mention is in terms of the, the response to the Mendoza review that we just heard from, from Chris, um, to ensure that there's a, a Scottish perspective 
in this, um, myself and colleagues from HES will be participating in some form of expert advisory group going forward. So I talked quite a lot about England. Um, so let's look a bit more about what we're doing in Scotland. So I mentioned uh, HES have launched Scotland's archaeology strategy and aim three of this strategy is looking at how we can support museums and the challenges that we're facing. Um, and I think one of the really nice things that we've seen coming about from the merger of ARCAMS and HES is that we're bringing together all those key elements in that discussion. So we have colleagues working with artifactual archives, you've got the archives team, and we've also got um, the archaeology and world heritage team that lead on the archaeology strategy and commission and, and fund archaeological research. So it really allows us to provide that joined up thinking that's needed to get a strategic overview of all the issues that are going on and try and approach it in a joined up way. Um, so the last thing I wanted to kind of briefly touch on is um, the reuse of archaeological archives. Because I think in terms of addressing the costs associated with that and having the community understand the value associated with archaeology archives, we really need to think about the importance of reusing these archives to recognise and release that value. So Brewer Couture is a project that HES has been involved with and it, this project demonstrates how using modern techniques and new research questions we can really realise the value of an archive decades later. And here we saw Dr Brown and Goldberg not only brought out new information but they brought a 1950s excavation to publication. And um, another project is a PhD that we're currently involved in doing a, a, a similar thing, looking to human remains and applying modern techniques to extract new information. So I think that although these projects focus on um, artifactual remains, I think that the principles are the same with uh, the documentary archive. And these are good examples of how we can demonstrate value and educate our stakeholders. And I think reuse is a really good way of doing that. So. Maybe that's something we consider as part of the discussion later. So it's a very quick whistle-stop tour of what um, I felt were key issues, but um, if uh, any questions, we can come to that in the discussion. So thank you very much.